to have been published or designed in the last two years, that the images can be from any period. Uh, and the book can also use found or historical imagery as long as it complements the book. Uh, the photographer or photographers have to be, you know, it has to be 100% their work. And sing, ah, now, Peter, can you clarify this for me? If the book is the work of a single photographer, the points, that their score can go towards points, or is that something we're going to attempt for next year? No, we're looking at that for next year at the moment. For next and, year. Yep. Sorry about that. So, yes, there'll be some more discussions after this year's round. So, I feel that I should start by just announcing what the new category preamble is, or the description of what we're looking for. This category is designed to celebrate and showcase photography in a printed publication where the photographs are the primary carrier of the communique. Thanks, Doug Spowett, for that terminology. Uh, judges will be asked to, above all, consider whether photogra the photography is fit for the purpose of the book. This award is designed to first and foremost recognise the photography in the book. But due consideration will also be given to the visual narrative along with its layout, design, topography, production values and packaging. So, on that note, I'm just going to give you a few quick stats on the books that we received. Uh, there were 17 entries in all, of which one was a trade published book, one was a government published or cultural institution publication, and 15 were self-published. Four of the books had ISBNs, which was interesting given that there was only one trade published and one government published. Um, five of them, the genre for the books was varied. Five were uh, about pets and wildlife. Uh, five were about people and portraits. Five of them were about travel, landscape or environmental photography. And two of them were more like personal journeys or personal projects. So there was quite a diversity. 12 of them were hardcover, three of them were softcover, one of them was spiral, and one of them was beautifully handbound. And I just like to point that out because there is such a diversity in the books that are received, um, which is why I think it's important that when we're, they're being judged, that um, we're looking at fitness for purpose as well as the photography and the design. Uh, finally, 12 of them were print on demand, four of which were from Memento Pro. Uh, Who was and that again? Uh, that was Memento Pro, oh, okay, yeah. and feel free to have a look at plenty more behind us after the judging. Um, and finally, two of them included boxes, and I felt they were, they were more experiential or there was um, more to them in terms of packaging, and one of those included audio, although that was not considered in the judging. Uh, so, oh, and 12 of them included text which I always find interesting to see how much text is used. So, now I'll hand it over to the judges to select a book that they'd like to talk about and um, share some of their thoughts. I, the first book I'll talk about is Hashtag Welcome Not Welcome by Hilary Wardhall. Um, it's a, a very personal document. I'm wondering, Peter, would you mind turning pages? I, I found it interesting that this was a group of photographs that it would have been difficult to, to present in any other form than a book. It, because of the folds and the reveals, you could not have done it as an exhibition, you could not have done many of the prints within the APA system, and it was the perfect vehicle for, <coughs> for, for, for a book. So I enjoyed it on that basis. As an aside, and not specifically this one, although pretty well all of them didn't contain a colophon, which is a technical term for the identity of a book. A colophon will talk about the edition, whether it's unique state of an edition of one or whether it's one of a thousand. And, and um, uh, it also sometimes talks about the paper that's used, the type font that's used, the size of the type font, sometimes down to the PMS colour of the ink that's been used. These, these are historical details that 
we go to all this trouble to make a book which is so much better than a digital file, still better than a print in a frame, and it should last a fair length of time. So we would like to think in an historic context somebody could work out the story of this book. And if you had a colophon on the back page, it would tell that story. So small point, but it's a bookmaking thing that you need to be aware of. So this is interesting in the fact of the folded reveals. Very, very interesting. <coughs> I don't believe you could use these photographs in any other form other than a book. So not not all of the pictures in this, uh, sorry, not all of the books in this uh, uh, collection that we looked at today pursued a theme. Uh, this was one of the books that did pursue a theme. Welcome, not welcome being an ironic term for um, uh, welcome, but not welcome, okay? Uh, please come into the room, but oh, actually maybe not, we're full, go away. Um, it's a darkly humorous, slightly sardonic, ironic, I suppose is the word, look at the whole question of exclusion in society, take that as you will, perhaps referring to uh, migration or economic class, what, 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 however you would like to interpret that. There are various examples of that in the book itself, but it pursued that theme in a, in a, in a humorous and incisive way right, right through to the very end. And it's one of the few books that relied entirely on the photographs to make its point. Um, apart from a brief introduction which explained to us what I've just explained to you, everything relies on the pictures. So you go on a visual journey from front to back. There's no text to back it up. The design is very simple and, and we felt generally it was a very successful photographic book. Well, I might uh, go to another, and I hope it's Hillary's as well. And I think one of the challenges we have as judges, what we have as a, a challenge as anybody who's actually reading a book, is to be open to all sorts of different ideas and approaches. And so on a one level, you can look at some of Hillary's self-portraits um, with her dad as being rather non-professional in approach and rather simplistic. You know, they're just taken with an iPhone or seem to be. Maybe it's a Samsung. Um, but what I found when I got to the end of the story that these photos showed was I really had a very strong emotional response to basically Hillary losing her dad. And when you look, and you know, we had some fantastic discussions about this where some people said, oh, they felt that maybe you know, Hillary was the only person that looked any different. And I said, well, I love the fact that her dad didn't actually look any different from you know, month to month as the photos were taken. And so I found this an incredibly challenging book um, in that it, it bas you know, we, we talk about the rules of photography, you know, compositional rules, and what makes the best photo is one that breaks all of those rules. And I felt that this little book, it's small, it's intimate, uh, it's just got you know, snapshot photography, but it's the idea behind the book that really carried it for me, that makes it so, made it so powerful. And yeah, uh, yeah. so that, that was how I responded to that. I think, well, most of us responded very, uh, I forget, got a silver or a silver with distinction, I forget which it was. I now. don't think we're going to talk about the scores okay, right yep. here and now, oh, but, right, but, okay. but it did generate a lot of interesting discussion. And I think uh, one of the points that I made was that this is a series of, of pictures of Hillary and her, her father who has, is suffering from dementia and he's basically not there in the pictures. She is incessantly upbeat, smiling throughout, and you're kind of distracted by her. But it's a slow burn, this book. You have to actually, and I, I actually made the critical point that I thought it would have been more interesting just to see a series of portraits of her father. But it's kind of like a long joke with a delayed punchline because the most powerful image in the book is second from the end. And you need to go through all of those pictures where Hillary is looking bright and hopeful and cheery and obviously there to cheer her dad up. He's not really taking part in this bonhomie, but in the end there's a picture of him semi-conscious on a bed in the background and she's looking very haggard in the foreground. And that's like worth, it's that picture alone makes the book, yeah. I think. So yes, yes, yes. Uh, what's interesting about the judging process is that you can flick through and get an impression, but to really judge impartially and properly 
you need to, to go through and, and read enough of the text for it to make sense. You've got to stick with it to the end because sometimes what happens at the end is just as important as what gets you into the book. Bill, what, what book do you want to show us? Uh, I'm going to just grab the one that's been, one of two that um, Libby identified as being conventionally published. So this is a good, you know, any kind of book can be entered here. Quite often photographers want to enter something that makes a personal statement, but indeed as working professionals we are often engaged by an organization or employed by, by an organization or commissioned by a publisher to produce a work um, for compensation. Um, it's not a personal project. This is Gary Kranich, who is one of our judges and, and a, a leading light in Queensland professional photography. Uh, it's published for the Queensland um, Museum. Museum. Queensland Museum. So what you're looking at here is a conventionally published book, uh, which ticks a lot of boxes. Uh, it, it may not in its own right be an award-winning piece of work, but it's a really good example of solid commercial publishing. And what's interesting about this book is that, as far as I can tell, all of the photography is is Gary's. No, quite a lot of stuff is not okay, so some of it no, is a, it's some it's of it is close close to ninety percent. Yep. So the majority of the work in the book is Gary, but inevitably, with a book of this sort, there will be a few pictures that are brought in to supplement his work. But um, at, for for specialist reasons, probably, what impressed me about this in terms of the photography was he is very competent. Uh, and produced excellent work across a whole range of subject matter, from flying eagles to invertebrates to insects, reptiles, the whole deal, landscape. Um, some of the pictures in themselves are standouts, others are workmanlike, but altogether it's, it's, it's a significant body of work uh, published in a conventional way by, by a publisher for sale to the public. echoes to the past, if I can talk about this, a collection of cyanotypes, handmade, I am guessing, but in the absence of a colophon, I do not know, I am guessing that it's a uni unique state edition one of one, just because of the nature of the material. It caused some discussion and debate amongst the panel, I have to tell you, at the bottom end, one or two judges felt that it was repetitious. There was no variety. On the other end, uh, at least one judge felt that they liked the unique and, and uh, special state of the handmade book, uh, which is tactile. In other words, you can feel it. The author's thumbprints uh, physically and metaphorically on this book. There's no question of it. You, you can see fingerprints, which are just delicious. Um, it suffers from a lack of a colophon, and it suffers from a reason for why the book was created. There's a reference to the woman who did work like this back in the 1800s right at the start, but then there's no further reference to it. Um, it, it was interesting to sit in on the discussion with the judges. I don't know if anybody else wants to pick that up, but uh, uh, it, it created a bit of to and fro. I'm flipping pages here. Uh, you want to flip? No, no, you can say it. Yeah. And I'll let you. No, so uh, I, I, I guess when it comes to judging books, it's a little bit like judging photographs, and yeah. we've all got an opinion, and we, we try to... I guess look at it objectively but you've got to acknowledge that subjectively is well, how you're going to come out at the other end and I was one of the judges who felt that there possibly needed to be a little bit more of a beginning and an end or at least a journey whereas I felt felt that a lot of these images made wonderful presentations you know maybe for a wall or an exhibition but in the context of a book where I was flipping pages I didn't feel that it had quite the story that I know Ian did he was being very diplomatic but I was one of the hard buggers I think not not as hard as you though Bill or was I I can't um, remember I'm just uh, no I, I quite like this but one of the points that was made it in it, it actually initiated a conversation about what is a book um, does a book have to be conventionally bound 
Uh, does a book is is a book not a book if it's spiral bound instead of st stitched and sewn, um, stitched and glued? I think is the term. Um, in this case, it's bound by thread. It's like cotton thread. Obviously, a, a handmade work, which is what at attracted me to it. So I think we arrived at a consensus that a book can take many different forms. The point was made, however, and, and Ian's already spoken about it, I, um, is uh, a collection like this an endless kind of loop, if you like, of plant impressions or photographs produced by cyanotype the right thing to put in a book or would they be better off edited down into a collection of say 15 or 20 pictures and printed a little bit larger and ex exhibited as a and and put and displayed as an exhibition or uh, as a folio uh, some people called this a folio in the room and not a book so that's a debate that you can actually have in your own mind we we were comfortable with what we arrived at yeah, no, I, I don't think there's any denial that it's a book and should be, yeah, I mean, all books, all the old books were, well, you can't say all, but yeah, using cotton to stitch your pages together is quite standard for uh, all publishers around and, and uh, printers around the world. But I, I guess the, the challenge really comes back to if you've got a book, what do you want the people to take away from that book? And it's like putting up a photograph. You want people to take away some sort of a message or a story, an idea, an emotion. And that's that, you know, with a book, you've got many opportunities to generate that and to develop it. And, you know, I guess that was where we, we differed. Some felt that the story and the feeling, you know, that handmade, that, you know, Ian really responded positively, whereas I, I was a little uh, harder, I guess, in that I, I would have preferred to have seen a bit more diversity. But that's just my narrow-mindedness, I'm sure. So, it's my turn. Um, yes, do I get to pick one? Well, okay, I'll try. Uh, lo those, those people who know me that I'm, I'm not the emotional type, I get told that uh, Tony Hewitt will tell everybody I have no em emotions at all. And, uh, and yet two of the p books that I've really responded to are all about, I guess, emotion and family and stuff like this. This particular book, um, it's about, well, I'm paraphrasing and I might get it wrong, apologies to the, to the author, but um, about two young girls who had an undiagnosable disease. And it's it sort of, we, we go in and out of the imagination of what their life could be, I suppose, or what their dreams and aspirations are. And it's, there's a contrast with some straight documentary shots of them in hospital, them being treated. And so you've got the reality to the irreality. You've got the color to the black and white. You've got this lovely bounce between um, fa fact and fiction as you go through. So to me, this book had a journey that you could take along with the author. And yes, it was very poignant, very emotional. Uh, and you look at some of those photographs and your, your heart goes out to the family. Um, yeah, the, the photographs, are, again, as a judge, I think it's important that you sit down and say, okay, you have a style as a photographer, a publisher, a designer. Other people have different styles. And in this style, I think the photographer did a sensational job. There's you know, no criticism that I can make. We all would do things differently, but I thought that the, the presentation was extremely, extremely strong and, and emotionally very, very powerful. Either of you guys want to add to that? Ah, uh, just it was the emotion for me. I I got it almost straight away, um, and and to be able to read that very quickly meant that the author had got through to me, and you can't get better than that, quite frankly. I th I think the thing that we agreed on to a person was that it was unusually a fascinating blend of documentary and conceptual photography. So uh, often on facing pages, you would have a documentary image which was taken from life, which showed realistically or literally the plight of these young girls. And then it would be backed up by a much more conceptual picture, which indicated some uh, dream state or some idealized version of them, which wasn't going to happen because they were sick. And, and it also has an air of mystery running through it because uh, these two girls have what is only described in the forward as an undiagnosed illness, undiagnosed disease. So they're slowly deteriorating from something that, that no one seems to be able to figure out how to fix. And the book itself has that air of inconclusiveness or mystery or abstraction uh, running through it. It's, it's, it's really a, a pretty tightly conceived piece, this one.
So this one's in, f in front of me, so I'll talk about this one. Uh, this one follows on from the little cyanotype book that we talked about before in terms of the commentary that we made. It's a series of black and white portraits all shot uniformly against a dark background of, of returned servicemen of some sort. And that's basically all the book is. Uh, it's, it's just kind of a roll a visual roll call, if you like, of individuals uh, of a certain age wearing their medals. Obviously, they have personal histories, but we're not told what those personal histories are. Now, a book is a convenient way to actually display these pictures, but we felt that it wasn't really sufficient content to make a compelling volume out of. We thought, interestingly, in this case, it would have been lovely to have a whole series of... I beg your pardon, there is some text with this. The there is some text with this, but most of them are just... just that was just the last page. Yes, just statements, you know, just visual statements. Um, we felt that... that um, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, it, these probably would have been a bit better suited to a series of framed portraits hanging in an RSL club rather than uh, encapsulated in a book where they tend to be fairly monotonous. When they are displayed in an environment which actually sp gives context to the subject matter, they might take on deeper significance, I think. One, one of the judges made the observation that all he could see was belly buttons all the way through. In other words, the, the camera point of view did not change and it wasn't necessarily a flattering point of view. And so uh, that, that was an observation from one of the judges. I, and I guess the other comment is that when you're entering awards, um, for the, the participants in the book, the people who are photographed in the book, the book would be fantastic as a, as a record, as part of their lives. Um, it, but it's sort of like we've all got family photos as well, which just in an, the awards are not going to be acknowledged by grouchy old grey-haired men who are judging them half the time like us. Well, at least we still got here. Well, I have a couple, yeah. I don't know, no, but so, but it's just a matter of you know. So, what do you choose to enter? And I, I think that you know, the, the photographer here has you know got some great portraits, and it's a great um, document. But it's possibly just not quite the right um, type of book to enter in. I suppose you, what we're what we're going to get excited about is not the sort of stuff that we might all do as a commercial assignment, but something that inspires us and gets uh, you know gets the creative juices going. So just like we aim for a silver award in the print. We're looking for that spark of difference, and it's the same with the books. You know, we're looking for that creative spark of difference to, to elevate the prints up. But you know, definitely a professional standard of photography and production. Oh, Ian, over to you, mate. You want me to hold this one up for you? Uh, um, we, we had mixed feelings about this book, but I think we universally agreed that it desperately needed editing. In other words, there were too many images. And, and probably in a tight edit, there would be a much stronger document. And equally, the difficulty with so many images is the, the couple of cracker good shots, and there are a couple in there, are overshadowed, literally washed over by a volume of, of imagery. And whether that's the difficulty of the author, whether it's a lack of um, assistance at the book production stage, um, it's a it's a it's a nice showpiece. It's a nice um, um, uh, show-off piece, but um, we we were concerned about the the production values of this particular book, and uh, every photograph you take in a story like this is not necessarily publishable. As, uh, as any good editor will tell you, whether it's magazine or book editor, weak pictures weaken stronger pictures. So you need to be quite uh, astute in choosing pictures that you decide to publish, and you need to be quite ruthless in culling ones that may not quite be up to the task. There was some discussion amongst us, quite validly, I think, that the, the nature of this book, with a lot of its rather chaotic layouts, kind of mirrors the life in India street life in India, which is, you know, endlessly bustling and noisy and colourful and, and mad and, and crazy and all those sorts of things. But I think the message here is pick 
choose one strong picture which tells that story and let that picture do the talking. Don't crowd 10 pictures onto a double spread and try to simulate the chaos of India. Let, let the pictures do the talking individually. Yeah, I, I guess the, uh, it comes down to within the book, the standard of photography is very high. And I think that's the, the message that we'd like to get across so if, if we're making a comment is that an edit would mean that that high standard of photography would be a little bit more obvious to us. With so many other photos, you also lose that sense of the author's, the photographer's voice, the old photographer's approach to photography, because there's so much in there that is really just straight, you know, commercial travelogue that the little moments of nuance and those wonderful bits of light and the, the gestures, etc., get lost in the, in the mess. I think you more or less said that. Yeah, you? and I think uh, to be even more specific about it, I, uh, we identified three different types of picture within the covers of this book. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of them are more like snapshots. Um, there were a, a small number of posed and lit portraits, which were rather confusing because they were out of the context of street photography, the realistic documentary photography that was taking place. And then scattered amongst that, there were some really strong, well-observed moments where the photographer had waited, waited where the timing was there, where the light was there, where the action was was happening and all those sorts of things. But those tended to get drowned out in the noise and colour of the other pictures. And I guess that just a, you know, something that you both got, have said already is that when it comes to a book, it's not just the photography. It's the photography in the context of the pages in combination with the design, in the words, the topography. Everything needs to sit together. And so as good as many of these photographs are, and there's no question how good a photographer the photographer is here. They're, they're amazing stuff. But then when you come to put it together, uh, it, that's, that's how you're telling us the story. And we can only basically... I, we, we respond to that cacophony of images in there and just found it was a little bit too much. The reason that you have editors yeah. is to edit your work and photographers are often the worst editors of all. There is a, there is a very old saying that uh, you can tell the quality of a book or a movie by the volume of what is on the cutting room floor. In other words, what you throw away and don't use is often an indication of the value of the document, the movie, whatever it is you're producing. So you're up for the next one. What one are you doing? So many to well, choose from. It's you. Me? You can. That's me. Yeah, I'll yeah. talk about memorandum. Uh, this, good. yes, this, this, this got the panel going. Trust me. A classic piece of academia. There, there is a rationale to this. It's very dense. It's, it's very abstract. Uh, it's been beautifully put together. It caused a couple of judges, one in particular to, <laughs> one of the judges to change his score quite dramatically after Bill Cashman uh, described a couple of things that happened in the back of this book because the judge concerned had got bored and didn't go to the end of the book. and. Uh, it's it's a series. Uh, it's all about a, uh, a series of pieces of memorabilia, and found in a museum, and then the author has gone and photographed people connected with that uh, em emporia, uh, and so in amongst it are 1940 pay sheets. There are. Uh, all manner of found objects that have been in a in a library, uh, but the repetition of the photograph, uh, the same photograph again and again and again, and again, was a deliberate uh, genre to force you to look for relief in the other objects that are on the opposite side of the page. Uh, quite academically founded and quite ac academically uh, constructed and we we had we had a lot of we, we had a good time discussing this one I have to tell you yeah we had a great conversation about this book uh, it was definitely the most challenging book that we had to look at it's called memorandum and memorandum is taken to mean to mention to call to mind to recount relate which means it must be remembered so there are this series of, of very similar portraits in series of in sequence of 
people from this community of a certain age, an elder generation, and they are, um, how do you say it, they're, they're counterbalanced against images of historical photographs, uh, wedding pictures, stuff that would come out of family uh, albums, um, all sorts of other types of imagery which represent them remembering things, okay? So memorabilia, memorandum, all this whole, this whole idea of m memory. And the fact that it's a little bit disjointed, some of the pages are folded, some of them are, are, are doubled up on each other, um, all those sorts of things, to, to me anyway, uh, to, uh, 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 and by discussion, indicated the, r the rather random and disjointed nature of memory itself. Um, and then finally, when you've kind of gone through this and gone, I'm really not sure what to make about this, make make out of this. At the end of the book is a series of interviews with these old people, and they're just talking about the way it was. They're just dredging up memories from the past, and ma actually making a tangible connection with a lot of the imagery, which up to that point has been quite mysterious. So this is a book that made you do a lot of work. It wasn't straightforward what it was. You had to spend some time with it. And in fact, to even judge it really, really thoroughly, we would have had to sit down and read the whole thing in, in, in some detail. But I think we've given you the essence of it. And it's also uh, lovely. It's really, it's a handmade, no. no, it's, it's yeah. But it has a handmade quality about, it has a handmade quality about it. It's, it's quite lovely. Who's next? You want to do dogs or dogs or yoga? Well, I can do yoga. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Um, okay, I'll, I'll look up. So there's a bit of discussion on the on the yoga book, and in terms of a photography book, um, the photography is great. There's some, you know, it, it's a, an interesting subject. Um, uh, well-balanced subject, one might say, and um, you know the the lighting's great. It's it's interesting in the way it, you know, the idea is there, and you flow it all the way through. And obviously, it's a use of photography with a, an, an another idea, the idea of yoga behind it. So it's not just a photography book. It's not just a photographer's book, but it's a book that's probably more for the well, I guess guessing the Yogi Bear people. No, it was just a joke. Yeah, the yoga pe people. One of the judges said. Wasn't it interesting that the words are on the right and the photos are on the left? Now, if the most important aspect of the book design are the words, then that's probably the right thing to do because as we read left to right and we open up the page, the first thing that is revealed are the words. But for photographers, if the photos were more important, wouldn't we put the photographs on the right? So this was just a discussion that we had. And that, there's no right or wrong with this. It's just a matter of what, you, what, what, what the purpose of, of the book is and where, where, where you're heading with it. Um, the size, yep, we, well, again, you know, talking from a, um, a design point of view, some people might feel that the text is perhaps a little bit large. Other people might say, well, you know, depending on the context that the book's being used, maybe it's just right. Um, some of the photos we felt, okay, so we're gonna now judge it from a photographic point of view, and the photos have got a uniformly high standard, but maybe there is a little bit too much repetition in a few, and a couple maybe, one of the judges thought that maybe just a little bit tightly cropped. Maybe there could have been a little bit more breathing space. Like when we ask for breathing space in our photographs within, single photographs within Apple, within the frame, maybe within the frame of the book, because you look at each page, each page is a frame, maybe there could be a little bit more space on some of them, maybe not. But it becomes a subjective thing. But um, I really enjoyed the book, and as I said, uh, I think the photography um, of, the, uh, of the, the, the portraits are fantastic. I love the shapes, the almost um, silhouette um, a result. Anybody else? No. Nope. Could I could I talk oh. about could I talk about the Tasmanian book, please? Tasmanian I'll book. do this one first, Corey, okay. and then we'll, we'll come to Richard's book. Yep. I'm just going to go to Zen Dogs because it kind of follows on from yoga, <laughs> okay? And 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 not to be in the least bit demeaning, but I would put both the yoga book and this book in the gift book category, okay? It's a very identifiable genre uh, classification within publishing. Uh, there are these pocket-sized books that you can be buy for $19.95, $24.95, which uh, make a great gift for people, particularly if they're a dog lover or a yoga practitioner, what have you. 
and they're usually accompanied by some kind of inspirational text, which was the case with the yoga book, which personally I could have done without because I thought the photographs were so beautiful. I almost just wanted to see it as a as a uh, as, as a display of this of, as a folio of poses in many ways. Um, this is. I'll let you do the, the barrel girl work here. I think that the um, the point behind this uh, this book is dogs in repose, if you like. So the photographer has, has edited all these studio portraits of dogs down to ones where they've got their eyes closed t t as if they were in some kind of zen-like state. Actually, they've just got their eyes closed. But um, what's, what's, <laughs> yes, what's kind of interesting about it is that this works for about a third of the book and then it's just a little bit more of the same. I guess, and again, I'm not trying to be unkind, I'm just trying to analyze it as, as a successful book or not. I think it is a successful book as a commercial gift book. I think for our purposes, uh, for award-worthy purposes, it's not particularly successful. There's nothing wrong with the portraiture, but it's all kind of full face, in your face kind of work. The heads are pretty much all that, that uh, you see. There's no relief, there's no variety apart from a change in background. The lighting's pretty much the same. Uh, there's no behavioral stuff. It's all just dogs with their eyes closed. And then as a bit of a, again, punchline at the end, there's a few pages of photographs of the dogs with their eyes open. So there's a bit of gimmickry about it as far as we're concerned. Ian, did you want to add something to that? Okay, now, Ian wants this guy here. Okay. I, I attacked this book three times. It's a, a, a self-published book by Richard Bennett. It talks about the west coast of Tasmania. It frankly, on first reading, is formulaic. I've seen a lot of books like this. Uh, it follows a lovely professional concept. Then I suddenly realised, to my surprise and amazement, that this was Richard bearing his soul about his history. And so there's a lot of historic photos in there, photos from 1960s, photographs with his wife standing on top of mountains, uh, camping gear lists, a really good curry recipe uh, given to him by Phil Kiravita's brother, the famous chef. And the, the second and third reading I went into it I realised what a personal document this was, what a personal statement this was, and, and so I got a little more excited about it. It is formulaic. Uh, there are a lot of books of this genre floating around the, the world, but this is very unique in that the author almost bears his soul. Not quite, but almost bears his soul. Bill, you got a observation on that uh, yeah it's not only I mean you first uh, at first at first look it's a book of landscapes but it's not actually what I wasn't excited about was the cover I didn't think it was a particularly strong cover it's a nice wraparound but it didn't do much for me in terms of a landscape it sets the scene for what's to come inside I suppose but um, it w the the contents are much more interesting than the cover so you can't judge a book by the cover um, what this is, is, as Ian says, it's a very personal document. It's almost like a, an extended journal. It's an autobiographical narrative. And that's what's really interesting about it because it contains pictures from an album that you might find in an album. Friends camping, grinning at the camera, that kind of thing. And you're thinking, oh, well, okay, fine. But it's counterbalanced against some of the pictures that you've seen there, which are uh, recipes, uh, piles of camping equipment, lists of various sorts, uh, records of different trips made, observations about conditions along the way. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's actually a really, really interesting document. So I'm not sure you would describe it as a purely photographic book, but it is a wonderful piece of personal memoir, or as I said, an autobiographical narrative which of which photography is a very, very, very important element. And in that sense, it's, a, it's actually a really, really interesting, interesting production and very well produced. I guess one of the questions we've got is that 
when we put a single photo up on the wall, we often bemoan the fact that we can't show two or three or a whole lot. We can't tell the whole story. When we've got a book, there's no limit to the number of pages, unless, of course, you go to Memento and they've got a special one. You can put as many pages in as you like. I'm stirring you. Uh, but there's no, you, know, you can have as many pages as you like to tell the story. And the question becomes, so how many pages should you have? And we've, all, we've, all three of us have talked today a little bit about how we felt this book might have needed an edit and that book might have been a little bit overdone on the number of pages. So, I mean, I, I look at Richard's book and he's giving us that as, you know, it's like uh, it is a memoir, it's a history. And so there's a side of me that says the number of pages uh, the, is the number of pages that's required to tell his story and that we shouldn't really get involved with telling him how many photos he needs to tell his story. On the other hand, he's now subject, he's subjecting himself to bloody being judged at Appa, the poor bloke. And so we're sitting here and we're looking at the book from a particular point of view. And we're looking for a, you know, it's maybe a slightly arty look. In the, in the, you know, that we, when we look at all of Appa, we admire the professionalism of everything we do. And then we reward those photos and those books that have got a little bit of a creative spark, which, which basically says they're the jobs we wish we could do all the time. And you know, when you look through Richard's book, and the places that he's been, you're always thinking about, wow, I wish I could do that. And I will say that I am on page 95 as one of the people who was photographed on the southwest track. But that, yeah, that's a completely independent comment. It's amazing you survived. <laughs> well, my wife's helping me out of the water, actually. I don't want my daughters to see that one. <laughs> Bill, you should talk about... You should talk about the first book. <laughs> okay, I can do that. Okay, so again, what is a book? This is actually a calendar. But what it reminded me of first and foremost was a flip, one of those flip books, okay? If you had it as a smaller book with horizontal format, you'd just flip through it and the pictures would, would kind of reveal the story as you went. What we have here is a documentation of a series of rescue dogs. Uh, I forget the name of the organization, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but on each page is, uh, you know, a utilitarian section at the bottom with a calendar and room to make notes and so forth, but then there's a, a principal, a portrait of the dog and some text explaining the dog's, the dog's history and so forth. Sorry, I can't, for, I can't resist. A utilitarian section. I just, I just wanted, is that, a t is that a technical term? <laughs> no, I just made that up. <laughs> it's a bit where you can write on. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, I think, in this, I think it's actually a really effective format for this presentation, because as a book, I don't think you get to actually enjoy the pictures of the dogs because it's uh, it's going to be behind covers, but the way it is, it's a new dog every week. Okay, so it's like it's like having a new puppy to train every week, um, God forbid, but it, it's actually a really effective format. Um, we probably didn't uh, think that it was the best thing we'd ever seen, but it was just an interesting twist on the idea of a book and how you present information, how you communicate with an audience with a photograph being the, the principal um, thing on the page. Did you want to add to that? On your turn, what are you going to talk about? Babies? Babies? So, uh, birth. This is another one where we, um, there's a difference, difference of opinion, I suppose, in that some of the judges felt that there was maybe a little bit too much in the book, and this comes back to the comment I was making about Richard's book about, you know, what is enough and what is too much. Personally, um, I looked upon this book and found it um, was ideally suited to the topic that it's covering. It begins at the beginning with photos of the hospital where you might go. And I, I'm imagining that, the, I, I don't know who the book is written for, but I'm imagining a lot of mums-to-be would buy the book and say, well, what's going to happen when I go through birth? Or maybe they've already been mums and they're reliving, if they want to do that, what, what they're going through birth. And with my limited experience of birth as a, as a male, uh, but. You know, I loved the way that that story evolved as we went through. 
I think that the hospital environments and the, the family birthing locations where a lot of these are taken are particularly challenging in terms of being a documentary photographer and I think the, the, the author, the photographer here has done a remarkable job and so I, I commended this uh, particular publication for the way that it documented and took us through you know, what is ostens uh, ostensibly a reasonably important part of all of our lives. Um, the, one of the challenges I guess we've had, um, this book came with an audio visual component. There was a DVD in the back which could have been played. We as judges weren't able to do that. We were notified at the beginning that this was part of the book. We're, we're just not equipped to do it. APA can't be all things for all people. So in some ways we've done the book a little disservice because we haven't looked at everything that was provided to us and we acknowledge that. On the other hand, I look at the photography, the way the book's been put together, there's a sense of design all the way through. I'm a bloke, so I don't probably like the swirly bits so much, but I know some of the women loved the way that the, t the topography worked. And you, know, you can't argue that there is a consistency there and uh, a design to be applauded. So uh, that, that was my take on it. I, I found it a very comp comprehensive, um, beautifully put together, and I really uh, loved the, the standard of photography all the way through. Uh, just two comments. I, I felt the text wasn't strong for the strong images. It's flowery and it's pretty, and that's probably or possibly thought to aim at the audience, but you can tell a strong story with strong text. That's not strong text. The second thing, the comment was made that in amongst some very powerful images, there are some very ordinary images to pad out the book, to make it as thick and as rich as this. And, and this comes down to, I believe, self-editing. I, I don't know that for a fact, but it's an assumption that a couple of judges made that um, uh, when we've spoken earlier about this, you can lose the impact of your best shots by having them next to or nearby some ordinary padding shots and it may be that you need that to tell a story but I believe strong shots tell a stronger story. So there was some there was some discussion about this is a very handsome production and it's got some amazing images in it it really does have uh, a handful of very 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 strong images but I would suggest to back up Ian that less is more that and in fact there was some conversation about the fact that this story could have been told more as a photo essay in a magazine that we didn't need an entire book for it now the author obviously had an intention an intention to audience um, it was maybe produced uh, up, well we don't know we don't know exactly who the who the audience was but um, obviously there was a reason that it was that it was produced as a book and lavishly packaged and presented the way it is but in fact this is the kind of story and the title is journey to the center of birth this is the kind of story that, that can be and has been very effectively told in a 20 picture photo essay as well. So y you need to kind of have a look at that on balance when you're judging books like this to see whether it's a story that's being told well, undertold or overtold. The, the concept of the Spanish doctor from Life magazine all those years ago was mentioned where literally a small number of very powerful photographs told a somewhat similar story to this. Yes, and that I come back to the point that says how many pages in a book is the right number? And to tell the story, if the photographer has been doing this for a long time and has got a lot of photos, I mean, I look at every little nuance. I mean, when you, don't, when you go into something that's new and you don't know what's going to happen, even though the story is told you five different times, you pick up something different from each of the five different times. And so for me, I, I actually think it was a good length. I don't have a problem with the number of photographs in there I, or the number of pages. Very lavishly put together publication. Got Memento Pro on the back. Should we be giving the sponsor a plug for that? Yeah. Oh, okay, right, okay. And there actually is a note here that comes with it from the author saying... Could you please play the DVD for the judges? And I've got various explanations and options. So that no, this is about a book. We're judging it as a book. We don't have the capacity to judge it in any other way. Multimedia may come into it more in the future, but I just don't, didn't want the author who's listening, perhaps, to, be, um, to feel slighted by our refusal to do this. We just didn't have any way to do it. And it's not what this category is about at this stage.
Who's next? I'll talk about trout fishing because trout that's fishing? something I, I know about. <laughs> so this is called Gold in the Riffles. It's 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 the do it's a simple documentation of a day sp uh, spent by three or four friends uh, hunting for trout in small streams in in uh, in the Highlands. Um, how to best say this? This is the kind of thing that you do a little booklet f for your friend. You had such a great day that you you come back and you do a book that's really for distribution to your friends. And the pictures all mean something to them because they were there, all right? But to the impartial observer, to the third party who's coming to this fresh, um, it has certain problems. Um, we took some issue with the way the pictures had been exposed, either using a red filter or a polarizer, or the way they'd been, the files had been prepared and printed. There's a lot of darkness in this. It creates a mood, but it may not be the mood that is actually best for that subject matter. Uh, it's difficult to print that with the kind of subtlety that you might hope for. And uh, I think really the problem with this is that it's very repetitious, the, the rep repetitive, I should say. The imagery is very repetitive. There's a lot of throwing lines into streams. There's a lot of walking across the ground. There's a few close-ups of rods and reels. Uh, there are precious few fish on display. Are there any fish on display? Uh, I, well, I'm a fisherman, I'm a fly fisherman, so I understand that it's not always possible to go out and catch fish to satisfy your every need, particularly if you're publishing a book about it. But, um, you know, there were certain elements in here that were lacking. A good, strong portraiture was lacking. You know, all the elements that we would expect of a student to come back uh, ha having produced for a photo essay, there's some pretty um, serious gaps in this, in this book. Nice looking, great memento of the day but probably not something that's going to win an award with us. It's another book about dogs. So Rescue dogs. Yeah. Another, another book about dogs. Um, high professional standard of photography. Please, for all the photographers that have entered their books, um, you know, including the gold book before, it's a good high standard of professional photography. We didn't really have any issues with the standard of photography overall in any, uh, in any of the books. So it's more a matter of now how do you present those photographs as a part of a publication and that, that's, that's where the, the semantics, I guess, start to happen. Um, in this particular book, we've got a lot of high quality photography in that if I were the client, uh, I would be ecstatic with the photographs of the, you know, the portraits of the dog because they would mean something to me. But as a judge looking at a photography competition, I just see a lot of very high quality professional photography, but I don't actually, and, and it's, it's nicely designed, there's a consistency through there, might be a little bit tight in the way it's laid out and all that, but you know, there's a lot of text, maybe you could have dropped the point size down, but now I'm just being subjective. That's just my view, not another designer's point of view. So we've been presented it, it it's been done very professionally, but where's that little bit of creative spark that makes me think as a judge, I'd like to go out and photograph dogs this way. This is probably how I'd photograph the dogs as well. I haven't been taken by the entrant to that next point. And that's one of the hardest things we have at APA is to explain to people, how do you get a silver award instead of professional practice. This is undisputably very high standard of professional practice. I can't remember uh, where, what it got, but it would have been close one way or another. And that's, it's just that little spark of creativity that's um, perhaps, for me, not, not quite in there at, at, at the moment. The, the Reasonable? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. And you're right, the, it was close but no cigar. Um, what I would, w uh, a point that I made during the, during the discussion about this book was that the approach the presentation of the photographs is very formulaic. Uh, the style of photography is very formulaic. We have a large full bleed picture of a dog not doing much on the left, and then we have a couple of supplementary pictures on the right. My main criticism was that if you think of photographs as either nouns or verbs, this is mostly nouns, okay? So these, are, these guys are all sitting over here doing not much on the left, 
uh, appealing enough dogs and appealing enough portraits, but where is the energy and joy and vibrancy and vitality of the dog, of which we all know dogs have? There's only a couple of pictures where the dogs are moving, running, uh, exhibiting any kind of behavior. So for me, the book was disturbingly static. It may be exactly what the author intended, but I wanted to see a bit more liveliness in the book, a bit more life in the book, okay? I wanted to see verbs, not nouns. This is a very, very clever bit of work here. It's called, what's the title, Ian? Enter If You Dare. Enter If You Dare. Rarely will you see such lovely production as this book, down to the hand-cut edges on the paper and everything and so forth. So this is a series of portraits of animals dressed up as circus performers and cast in particular roles uh, with, as you can see from the design, accompanying typography that suggests the kind of rather hectic nature, nature of a circus um, and with a little bit of a story that goes with it there, okay? So I think one of the points that we made was this is not only successful as a bit of art, art publishing, but also uh, could be quite successful as a commercial as a commercial production, okay? So uh, there's a lovely, again, handmade quality to the book. It's got a lovely feel, hasn't it, Pete? Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's really nice to hold. And that's, let's, you know, w when so much of our life is lived online these days behind the impersonality, impersonality of a screen, it's really nice to still have something that you can hold in your hand and feel as well as pages to turn and you know, there's texture about it. There's volume. It's got some weight. Uh, it comes in a beautiful box. It's wrapped in velvet, all those sorts of things. Cooley, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I should speak up because I was the dissenting vote. <laughs> I, I felt it was overproduced and that we were looking at production values and less on photography. I have to clearly say that I was well overshadowed in the discussion and the scoring that took place, but it's a valid opinion and it was validly held and offered. Um, it, it, um, I was intrigued by it, there's no question of that, and uh, as a piece of publishing craft, there is no doubt that it's up at the top degree. Uh, it's a publishable commercial uh, value object there's, there's no doubt of that. But my feeling was that all of the, the deckled edges and the, the tricks of the trade and the velvet wrap and the, the little clamshell box took away just a little bit from the, t the small photographs that are contained within. But that's a dissenting view. So by contrast, we probably, and this is, we're just doing this last because it happened to be the biggest book and sitting on the bottom, one of the biggest books and sitting on the bottom, but by contrast with that, this book by Steve Scalone called Urban Clarity is probably the most closest, it's probably the closest to what we would understand to be a photography book, all right? Uh, it relies almost 100% on the photographs itself for the narrative, for the impact, for the, st for the story, for the appreciation, for the aesthetic experience, all of those things. And it is a series of urban street photography, which very cleverly combines a whole range of things, actually. It combines, it combines black and white with color. It combines architecture with light and shade. It combines uh, uh, street scenes with humanity. There's a great uh, there's a great procession of humanity right through the book. So your interest actually never flags. And we all kind of got halfway through this book and thought, okay, it's got to fall apart pretty soon because you can't keep up this standard. And you know what? It just keeps on going. This book has amazing momentum. Momentoum, sorry. It's got 
<laughs> um, it, it really has tremendous energy, this book. Uh, and I think that if we're purely judging it, judging books as photography books, this is probably the one that comes closest to the ideal monograph, if you like. Uh, uh, the point was made by Ian that this looks like the work of someone who's about 70 years old and, and trying to encapsulate his life's work. It's a retrospective, but in fact, the photographer himself is quite young. It's just that he's very productive, very energetic, uh, very passionate, and has the most marvelous collection of these. They're, they're, it's, it's, and, it's, and it occupies this really interesting um, sort of space which includes travel photography, it includes architectural photography, it includes people photography, um, street photography, all of those things uh, really come together in this book and really really keep your interest all the way through. The fact that it's, uh, it's actually really well designed, the fact that it mixes black and white and colour doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Often it does, but in this case it doesn't. The use of coloured panels and pages within the book is really good because it keys off colours in the photographs and so forth. So I think it's just uh, a really completely realised production. Pooley, you want to add to that? Uh, what he said. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a slightly uh, differing view, dissenting view, uh, but um, I tended to agree with what the judges were saying, which basically is what Bill, Bill's just put forward. Yeah, I hated this book. <laughs> I'm just jealous. Okay. <laughs> That's I all. Unless you want to, in the, we want to critique I my I handwriting. I think, I, I think, I think we done. could spend a couple of seconds with our live audience if they had any questions to fire at us before we shut the machine down. You can't talk to a microphone, but we can repeat your question if anybody wants to fire a question at us. Uh, we were as five judges, and we represent three opinions here, not always agreeing, but always accepting of the sc final score for every one of the 17 books. There's no question of that. We had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Paul? Um, it's slightly sideways to the previous one. It feels as if that will always play that. Uh, but that was a different version of my book that you had in the first one. What's that like? Uh, handmade feature, you know, slammed shelf off, thousand odd to this one book. Paraphrase the question. So we have for, for the uh, online audience, the, uh, I'll paraphrase the, phrase the question. So if you've got two versions of the book, one's done on an inkjet and uh, RGB, but CMYK ink, but an RGB file, or you'd get a commercially done, which is CMYK, the quality might not be as good in a mass-produced book as in a one-off. Which one would you put into the awards? Is that the question you were making? Because... Uh, okay, yep. So how important is the production process? The production process, I think, would make a huge difference so that if you, if this book were presented and the quality of the reproduction was not good, it would not get as high a score. If it doesn't get as high a score, then that sort of obviously limits how far you can go within the awards. Um, if I had a choice between a hand-printed book, all done on inkjet paper and bound together, and something that was done on a, a machine, I would I would do the, the former every time, because you're trying to impress five judges who are like you, passionate about photography, and what's going to make us happy and when we see a beautifully reproduced book, no matter what. Same as a print. If you're going to hand print, you know, do, well, you're not going to dot by dot, are you, with your hand prints? But, you know, a high-quality print is going to get you a much better score than a print that's missing the blacks, a little bit burnt out etc it's the same with book production is very very important so I don't know if I've answered your question but uh, yeah oh, fundamental fundamental yeah and, and, and in which case it yeah. it's not that you get judged down it's that that individual book where the entrant has taken the care to get because you know, if you've got a mass-produced book you can go and get an individual one you know one off made for the awards no trouble so just uh, along those lines also, just for the, for the benefit of people who are interested in this category, the first thing that we look at, there are primary 
a primary criterion in judging books is the photography itself, okay? So because this is a, photo you know, the app is a photography award system. It's a competition for, for photographers. There are plenty of awards, uh, award competitions out there for uh, book publishers and authors and so forth, any number of them. That's not quite what we are. So we kind of arrived at a default setting for our deliberations over, over books in that, that more or less says this. If you have two books where it is absolutely you can't get a cigarette paper between the quality of the photography in each book, then you would go and look at the design and presentation of the book to see which one stands apart, which stands a little bit, a, a little bit taller, okay? So first and foremost, we're interested in the photography. That's why, uh, even though the scores haven't been made public yet, some of the books that we've talked in fairly glowing terms about might not have gotten quite as high a score as you might expect because the photography in them was just one of many components as opposed to some books where photography was it. That was all about the photography. So there's a lot of things that we consider, but remembering first and foremost that this is not a publishing industry award, it's a photographic industry award. Colophon, C-O-L-L-O-P-H-O-N, Colophon. Uh, look it up in your Funk and Wagnalls. Uh, it, Funk it's, and Wagnalls? It's, it's, it's a, for me anyway, it's a critical element of any book. And be that a self-published, unique state edition of one or something larger, it identifies the book. And... I don't think a single one of these books in 17 had such a thing. It's yeah. often on the last page. Two of them did. Two of them did, Two thank them you. Did. It's often on the last page, not the front page, funnily enough, uh, but it's, it's one of those signifiers. But it's part of the book law that if you're going to start publishing books and do it again and again, you do need to do some research and you need to understand what a book is about. And, and I'm not going to touch on that now. We, we don't have those type of months and years to talk about. Yes. It's sometimes called the imprint page. Yeah. Sometimes called the imprint page. Otherwise known as who done it. <laughs> okay, so uh, Libby, you're going to clear up. You're going to close up now, I think. As, as our illustrious sponsor, and because I don't know what the hell to say, I figured I'd just dump you in it. All right. Um, that's okay, because I did want to comment on... Um, oh, apparently I'm not in view. Where do you go from there? Uh, I did just want to comment on what I found fascinating about the judging today, and you've all um, mentioned something along these lines. Um, the judging for the awards here are very much about the photography, um, which it should be. Um, what I found fascinating was some of them, you made a few comments about books that had photography with poetry or quotes or poetry, w uh, sorry, photography with architecture. What I find fascinating is that in the commercial publishing world that it is the more kind of gimmicky or the the, the photography is sometimes secondary, that is what publishers are actually more interested in at the moment. It is what sells, but that's not to say there's not room or a market for fine art or conceptual or, you know, uh, more purist photographic books. There's a, a booming um, uh, kind of world of festivals and book fairs, and Melbourne is the home of such things in Australia. So, um... On that note, I would just like to say if anybody ever wanted to produce their own photo book that we would be delighted to produce that for you. But we would also um, assist you where we can with advising on design or editing or who the support services are who can help you to make it the best book. So thank you, Ian, Peter, Bill. Goodbye. <laughs> All right, thank you. Alright.